Hey, Living the Lifers, good to have you here again at Growth Groups. We're going to jump into things quickly this morning and give you as much time to discuss in your groups as possible. And so I just want to bring up in your reading this week that you did, you encountered a lot of parables. And as many of you know, Jesus taught using parables all of the time. It was his way of taking those complex truths of the Word of God and relating them in a simple way so that even the uneducated could understand. And in doing this, um, I believe, just historically speaking, that Jesus was the best teacher who ever lived. That's why 300 of us or more in this church are studying his life and reading and meditating on the words he spoke 2,000 years later. You also may have noticed that many of the parables that Jesus spoke started out with the kingdom of God is like. He was trying to get us to look beyond the tangible things of this world and learn about how the kingdom of God operates and functions. The physical laws of this earth differ from the spiritual laws in which the kingdom of God operates. As Christians, the scriptures tell us that we are no longer of this world, we are still in it of course, but are now aliens here, and our citizenship is in heaven. So if we have been transformed from being slaves and citizens of this dark world to being citizens of his kingdom of light, then it is also true that some of his kingdom is here on earth, and it's represented by you and by me. I don't want to get too confusing this morning, but his kingdom is here and it's yet coming. It's not fully here, but it's partially here, and as we allow ourselves to live the life that he has called us to, we build his kingdom every time we are a part of someone coming to Christ, every time we stand in the gap and intercede on someone else's behalf, every time that God uses us in his gifts of the Spirit to minister to others. So as citizens of heaven, we have the privilege, it's a privilege, of building his kingdom here and now until he comes and brings his kingdom in its fullness. I say all of this because it is so important that we understand what his kingdom is like. For anyone who desires to be a kingdom builder, these kingdom parables are imperative. And let me say this, the more the kingdom of heaven that we allow to affect us and change us, the more we can operate within the spiritual laws of that kingdom. So let's talk about one of these important parables this morning, the parable of the weeds. It is only recorded in Matthew, and it's actually one of the parables that Jesus explained. It's found in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. It says this, He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now let's go to the explanation. It's found in Matthew 13, 36-43. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the son of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. 
He who has ears, let him hear. The man who sowed good seed is the son of man, or Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. And this is in contrast to the parable of the sower, where the seed is the word of God. And that's how we usually think of the word uh, seed in the Bible, the seed of the word. But in this case, Jesus said that the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, which means the people who are in Christ those that have received him and have entered into a relationship with him. Jesus then explains that the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the sower of those seeds is the devil or Satan. Now the harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters or reapers are the angels. And this goes right along with what it says in Revelations uh, chapter 14, which talks about the harvesting angels. The growing weeds will be harvested first, and they will be burned in the fiery furnace. And then Jesus adds this. He says, it's a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, which of course helps us understand that he's talking about hell here. The growing wheat will then be harvested by the angels and brought into the barn or heaven. And then Jesus says, they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So I want you to picture this this morning. Picture a, a beautiful wide open field. The soil is black and fertile. It's been plowed and cultivated and you, you just want to pick it up and grab it. And uh, it, it looks like it's just ready for seed. You know what kind of soil I'm talking about? We're all from Iowa. We get it. And this is the world. Jesus then plants his good seeds. He places Christians throughout the world. He sows them right where they need to be. And Satan takes advantage of the opportunity and plants his followers, who are represented by those that have not received Christ, those who have rejected him. And uh, so here's a question I have. What produced that opportunity for the enemy? And this is one part of the parable that Jesus didn't plainly explain. The disciples had just asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And in his response, he said, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. I think there are mysteries in regards to the kingdom of God that we will never be able to figure out until we get to heaven. And then there are mysteries in regards to the kingdom that diligent students of the word will be shown. It'll be revealed to them. Some mysteries are easier to discover than others, but what produced that opportunity for the enemy? That's my question. In verse 25, it really gives the answer. It says, but while his men were sleeping, but while his men were sleeping, who are the good sower's men? Who fall asleep on the job and gave an opportunity for the enemy to plant his tares among the wheat? I believe he's referring to church leadership. And before you say, aha, it's the pastors who lead us astray, think about all ministers within the body of Christ. And I personally believe that every member of the body of Christ is a minister or a servant on some level. That's what minister means, servant. Yes, pastors have failed, but everyone within the church of Jesus Christ who is no longer a babe in Christ Everyone who has gotten off the mere milk of the word and is now feeding on the meat of the word, every minister or again servant of Christ has failed at times. And to me, this is a wake up call. It's a wake up call to all of us to stay alert and not fall asleep, spiritually speaking, lest the enemy comes and plants tares among us. Here's something else to consider. The workers could tell without much effort that weeds had grown up amongst the wheat. This is to say, those who are planted by the Lord look differently than those planted by the devil. Now, I believe this speaks of the way we live the life, the way we live it out loud. And there is a holiness that marks a Christian's life. And it's not birthed out of a self-efforted or, or self-effort legalism, if you will. It flows out of a pure-hearted love relationship with Christ. 
So in this field that, that is the world, we have weeds uh, or tares growing alongside wheat. And Jesus says to his workers, don't pull up the weeds because you might pull up some of the wheat along with it. Jesus knew that if the church was out judging those in the world, trying to do the work that is meant for the harvesting angels to do at the end of this age, that they would become ineffective and push the wheat away from the things of God, causing their roots to become entangled with the roots of the tares. That's all a mouthful, but, but I believe that when the roots, the wheat roots get tangled up in uh, the weed roots, a lot of difficult things begin to take place within those lives. Entanglements that God never intended his wheat to be involved with. That could have been avoided if his workers would not have fallen asleep. So when it comes to the world, the field, don't make it your responsibility to bring the judgment of God down on them. They don't get it yet, and that's not your job anyway. Judgment within the church is a different thing, however. There are those that claim to be in Christ that are actually wolves in sheep's clothing and false prophets. And I think some of them don't even know they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And Jesus warned us about them in Matthew 7, 15. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. It's extremely important that we don't take the rules in which Christ tells us to deal with the lost and try to use them in the church, or to take the rules that we are to use within the church and apply them to those that are in the world. Yet sadly, this happens all the time discerning whether someone within the church is acting or operating in a biblical manner is in fact making a judgment. And that's an important part of our Christian lives. Just don't try to use those methods in reference to people outside of the kingdom of Christ, because then it just gets messed up. Mixing these all up throughout the church's history has really made the world think that the church is arrogant, it's judgmental, and that they think, uh, that we all think we're better than everyone else. And on the flip side of that, it has created within the church a kind of attitude that says, no one has the right to question me or, or even correct me. Spiritual authority in the church has lost its ability to lovingly correct. And so many within the church find themselves gravitating to the congregations that are more open to the lifestyles that they themselves want to live. Okay, I realize that this is a lot to absorb in 10 minutes, but I hope that it has sparked some things to discuss and even things to meditate on as you continue in your class this morning and as you keep reading through the life of Christ. Again, thanks for being here today and we'll see you in the sanctuary in a few minutes.